I am rolling. Rolling. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. All right, everybody, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich. And I am Santa Rish, bringing you yet another episode this holiday season. Did they deserve it? Were these boys and girls good little listeners? Uh... I think you have to be naughty to listen to our show. I think it's pretty much one of those prerequisites, a requirement. Oh, okay. So probably not. But uh, we're going to give them gifts anyways, because, you know, naughty people are always the ones that actually wind up with all the good stuff, right? Indeed. (laughs) So there you go. (laughs) So yeah, we're back with part two of The Christmas Creature by one... B. D. Anklevich. His name matches his eyes. Thank you. That's so nice of you to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and jump into it. If you recall last time around, the people uh, in the story had an elf on the shelf, and it was a scary elf on the shelf. And <laughs> if you haven't listened to the first part of the story, you should, because... This story is not good if you start in the middle, as is the case with pretty much all stories. So don't start here. Run back, listen to the uh, last episode, then come back and listen to this episode if you haven't already done so. So we're just going to go ahead and go straight into the story and uh, I'll let you guys listen to it. And then on the other side, we will uh, come back and we'll talk about it. For a change. <laughs> the Christmas Creature, Part 2. creature had to be there somewhere. He couldn't believe that it just got up and walked away on its own. It was a toy. A little kid's doll, not some kind of evil imp that was sent from hell to ruin Christmas. Try as he might, however, he could not find it under the bushes anywhere. What did it mean? Was creature actually alive? Possessed by some demon and here to terrorize them? He was starting to believe that it, in fact, was exactly that. He gave up his search and went back inside to Macy. He walked in the door and screamed, Macy, look out! She was no longer on the phone with her mother. She had turned the TV back on and was watching Santa Claus's Coming to Town on Netflix. On the shelf right above her head, Creature was raising a kitchen knife, preparing to jump. Macy started, turning toward him. What, Brand? Brand dashed toward her as fast as he could go, and Creature leaped off his perch, knife pointing downward in a stabbing position. Brand was still ten steps away. He would never make it. His apartment was so small, and he never thought he would find himself wishing it was smaller. But he did. Creature dropped like a stone, a possessed, murderous stone, and drove the kitchen knife into the back of Macy's hand. If Brand hadn't shouted and caused her to turn, it would have gone into the back of her neck. Macy screamed a deep, throaty scream that didn't sound like it could come from an eight-year-old girl and spun back around. The knife was lodged in the back of her hand and blood was welling up from the wound. Creature let go of the knife and dropped to the floor, disappearing under the couch. Creature? Oh my god! It is real! She screamed when she saw the elf drop away from her wounded hand. Brand arrived at her side, took her by the arm, and led her to the kitchen. Come here, Macy! Oh my god, are you okay? Does it hurt? He babbled as he pulled her to the drawer where he kept the dish towels. He didn't think paper towels would be enough to handle the blood that was going to flow when he pulled the knife from her hand. I'm going to fix your hand, Macy, Bran said, but I need you to watch out for creatures so he can't do anything to us while I'm busy, okay? Okay, I'm watching. Her head darted back and forth, searching around the kitchen for anything that might be moving. Okay, this is probably going to hurt pretty bad, Macy. I've got to take the knife out of your hand. Get ready and grit your teeth, okay? One, two... Three. He pulled up on the knife, doing his best not to angle it and cause further cutting on its way out. 
Macy grunted bravely, but did not scream. The blood really began to well up now, the flow doubling its speed. Oh God, she said, look at the blood. That's a lot. She was looking a little pale as she stared at the hole through her hand. Don't look at it, Macy. Sometimes seeing blood makes people get sick and pass out. We can't have that right now. Do you see Creature? Macy's head snapped back up, tearing her eyes away from the wound and began scanning the area again for danger. Brand wadded up two dish towels and pressed them hard against either side of Macy's hand. Hold those on tight, okay? He said, then took a third towel and used the knife still coated in blood to cut a hole in it. Then he grabbed it by the hole and ripped it into a longer strip that he could use to tie the towels to Macy's hand until he was able to take her to the hospital. More field medicine. He was becoming a real medic and was most definitely at war with a shelf elf. This was bad. Would he ever be allowed to see Macy again if this happened to her the first time she came to visit? He shook his head to chase the thought away. He couldn't worry about that now. He had to neutralize Creature first, then worry about the consequences later. He heard a pitter-patter noise from right behind him, and Creature plunged another kitchen knife with surprising force, this time into Brand's ankle. Oh, fuck! He shrieked and looked for the elf, only to see it sprinting comically away. The movement of its tiny body was cartoonish. He couldn't believe he was being relentlessly attacked by a living toy. And now it was around the corner and out of sight again. Sorry about that, Macy. Oh, that hurt really bad. Don't worry about that, Brand. We just need to get Creature. Brand grabbed the knife and yanked it from his ankle. Blood oozed and his muscle ached horribly. It screamed out in pain at him with every step as he went to the silverware drawer to discover that all six of the steak knives that he owned were missing. That meant the creature had four more to deploy. Not to mention whatever else it may have in store for them. We need to find some way to fight back, Bran said. The bat by his bed came to mind as possibly the perfect tool for the job. Creature wasn't much bigger than a baseball. However, Bran had never been all that good at baseball. He couldn't hit pitches that came at him in the strike zone, much less in the dirt. He needed a target more the size of a basketball to get a hit. The bat was supposed to be a weapon against a human, not an elf. A tennis racket would probably be better suited to the task with its wide head to catch little things as they went by, but Bran didn't play tennis, so he didn't own a racket. Then it came to him. He'd actually been on the receiving end of a blow delivered by one of these years ago. What he needed was a frying pan. That would be the perfect weapon for this situation. Keeping an eye out for another foray from Creature, Brand pulled the cabinet open and retrieved his one frying pan. For good measure, he grabbed his one pot as well and handed it to Macy. It was a pretty small saucepan, but it would be better than nothing, which was his other option. We've got to find that elf and smash it with these pans, okay, Macy? He said, panting with the stress and the pain. Okay, she said. So, do we go looking for it? I guess. But we probably need to walk back to back or something so we can't sneak up and stab us again. Follow me, but walk backward, okay? All right, she said, and formed up behind him. They walked out of the kitchen toward the living room where they had last seen Creature flee. Watch out for under the couch, he said. Though that would certainly be his job since he was the one walking forward toward it. He kept his frying pan low near his waist. Any attack would probably come from below. His arm was tense, ready to swing a mighty forehand stroke. Creature didn't dash out from under the couch with a knife in hand, however. They walked slowly past, and Brand shifted his attention to other places that it might come at them from. The shelves, the top of the TV cabinet, the coat closet, but it remained out of sight. Then he heard that skittering noise that he originally assumed to be a rodent and knew Creature was on the move. Macy yelped and Bran spun to see her bring her pot down on top of the elf's head. It dashed out from under the couch after all, but had waited for what it assumed would be the more vulnerable of the two of them. It had assumed incorrectly, apparently, because Macy crushed the fiend with her saucepan. There was a pong sound and the knife that it had been carrying fell harmlessly from its hands. She raised her pan and brought it down again. Brand was by her side now, and the instant she raised the pan, he brought his frying pan down on Creature. 
Without the knife in its hands, the blows made a less satisfying sound, just a tiny thump as the metal smashed onto the plastic of its head. Macy backed away, putting Brand between herself and Creature. Brand hit it again and again, and soon the thing no longer moved. He must have crushed its little plastic brain or whatever it might have in that head running the show. He stood up, keeping his eye on Creature without even blinking. <sighs> Are you okay, Macy? His question cut off when Creature jumped up as if it had never been hit even once and dashed back into the kitchen where it was out of sight again. Oh shit, he wasn't dead! Damn it! Brand swore. Things had progressed enough that he didn't even feel bad about swearing like that in front of Macy. It didn't even occur to him this time. Brand dashed after Creature, his pan held at the ready, but when he came around the corner, the elf was nowhere to be seen. He pulled open the cupboards one by one, but found nothing but cooking utensils, and the other various detritus he'd filled these cupboards with since he didn't have enough dishes to his name to fill them. He shrieked when Macy came up behind him and took his hand. She shrieked back again, startled by his scream. Oh, jeez, it's, it's you. Sorry, Bran said. Do you see Creature anywhere? No. Where'd he go? Macy asked. I don't know. There's nowhere else to go. I didn't see him at all. He didn't pass me to get out, so he's got to be here somewhere. As he spoke, Bran felt a searing pain strike him in the right shoulder. He screamed and turned around. Creature wasn't there, however, because he was hanging from the knife in Bran's back. He could feel the monster bouncing from the handle. He stretched back to grab Creature but couldn't reach. Macy screamed and Bran felt the knife yanked from his back. He spun back around to see Macy holding Creature by the scruff of the neck like a dangerous cat that might claw her at any second. And it certainly would. Creature was thrashing wildly about, trying to free itself, and swinging the barbecue fork that it had in its hand, stained with Bran's blood. It hadn't been a knife after all. Where did he even get that barbecue fork from? He didn't even realize that he owned one. He sure didn't own a barbecue. The first thing it was ever used for was to stab him in the back. Brand reached out forcefully and grabbed the handle of the fork from the flailing elf. It came free easily, but the elf continued to thrash in Macy's grip. Brand grabbed Creature by the neck and squeezed as tight as he could. He held no illusions that he could choke Creature to death, but he didn't want the hissing, spitting little monster to get loose and mount another assault. He bashed Creature's head against the counter, but it didn't make any difference to how much the elf struggled. What could he do to kill something that wasn't alive to begin with? He looked around the kitchen and seized on an idea. He went to the corner, pulled the lid off the blender cup and stuffed the elf inside, capping the cup immediately so that it couldn't escape. Then he switched it on to puree. Creature bounced around inside the clear cup, his plastic head taking divot after divot from the spinning blender blades. The soft fabric covering its arms and legs wrapped around the blade and began winding into its rotating base. Suddenly the blender jammed, buzzed for a moment, then shut off with a click. Brand leaned forward and looked in through the thick glass, trying to judge whether Creature was truly done for in there or not. It definitely hadn't been shredded to pieces like he'd hoped. He didn't have money for one of those expensive blenders that you see on YouTube videos that can liquefy car batteries and suits of medieval armor. He got the cheapest possible blender and lived with the consequences of it jamming over and over again. He just never suspected that the consequences might include being stabbed by a vivified Christmas decoration. Do you think it's dead? he asked Macy. She came over and looked closely in through the glass of the cup, too. I don't know. I thought the blender could cut him to tiny pieces, but he definitely isn't. Yeah, said Brand. Me too. All right, I'm going to dump Creature out of the cup. And if it moves, then I'll stab it with this barbecue fork. Have that frying pan ready in case you need to defend yourself. Okay, she said, grabbing the pan. Ready. Bran got the fork ready to go and grabbed the blender cup. He upended the cup to dump Creature onto the counter. The lid landed with a soft thump, but Creature remained within, wound into the spinning blades. Bran raised the cup so he could look inside. Creature dangled from the blades limply. Its head was riddled with hundreds of cuts and divots, and its hat was so shredded that it was hanging on its head by a string. None of the damage looked fatal, though. 
especially considering that Brand had no idea what made the thing tick in the first place. He was going to have to reach in and pull the monster out of there if he wanted to be sure. But he didn't want to expose his hand to the damage it might take if the elf was only playing possum and attacked again. It hadn't bit yet, but maybe it could. He looked down at Macy. She was gazing back up at him expectantly and... Was that... admiringly? This was an opportunity he couldn't pass up. He sighed, steeled himself, and reached into the cup to untangle Creature and draw it out of the blender cup. Creature remained inert as Bran unwound its arms and legs from around the blender's blades. It still didn't move as he pulled it free and set it on the counter. Was it dead? How could he know? What do you think? Is it playing again? He asked Macy. Probably, she replied with a nervous tone. How can we know if it's dead? I don't know, Macy said. But we need to kill it before it kills us. Then Brand had an idea. This had to work. He grabbed the knife, sticky with the blood from his ankle, and put it to Creature's neck. Then he picked the elf up and pulled on both the head and the body as he sawed at the neck. Brand jumped and yelped when Creature suddenly began bucking and thrashing in his hand, but the pressure of the pulling and the serrated steak knife sawing almost immediately severed the head from the neck, and Creature went limp again. He dropped the decapitated body back to the counter. You did it! Macy cheered. Goodbye, Creature! I hate you and I won't miss you! Brand merely slumped against the counter behind him, panting. It wasn't the effort, however, but the stress and strain that had worn him out. Good job, Macy said, and leaned in to give him a big hug around the waist. It was the first time Macy had ever shown him affection, and despite the strangeness of the day and the seriousness of the situation, Brand couldn't help but smile and hug her back. He closed his eyes and reveled in the moment. He'd done something right this weekend. But now he'd probably better get her to the hospital, because she was going to need stitches for that wound through her hand. He couldn't believe his eyes when he opened them back up and saw Creature's body stand up, grab its head, and scramble away. Brand had to cancel his trip to the hospital for now. The last thing he wanted to do was leave his home unguarded and come home later to discover what creature had cooked up for them in the interim. He didn't want to wait too long, though. He knew you only had about six or eight hours before it was too late to get stitches. He had to find creature quick and put this to an end. But how could he even do that? Creature seemed to be invincible. He'd cut its head off and it had just stood up collected its head, and run off. Not only that, but it had also managed to thwart his attempt to shred it in the blender. That may have been a lucky break for Creature, but it had still happened. The monster was nigh on indestructible. So what was he to do? Creature obviously didn't function like a human, despite the similarities in shape. It was just a doll. There were no muscles, veins, or organs inside the body, just stuffing. Whatever evil force, demon, spirit, or whatever might be animating it, didn't seem to need any of that to make creature function. Removing its head did not work like it would have with a person. However, creature did take its head with it when it dashed away the last time. Did that mean that it did at least need all the parts to keep working, even if it wasn't all in one piece? Maybe Brand had been onto something when he threw creature in the blender. Maybe he just needed to shred it down small enough that it couldn't do anything further. Next time he got Creature in his hand, maybe Bran should just keep going until there wasn't enough left to reassemble. Maybe he should burn the pieces just to be safe. That sounded like a good idea. First, however, he had to get the monster in hand. I hate to break this to you, Macy, but Creature is gone, Bran said. What? Macy said, spinning around to look back where the elf had lain. How? You cut his head off! He's dead! Yeah, but I don't think it was ever alive to begin with, Macy. How do you kill something that's not alive? Brand asked. Macy screamed in frustration. Ah! How is it alive at all? What is it? What's going on? Then she screamed again. He understood how she felt, but he couldn't indulge with her. 
At the very least, he had to keep it in check just because he was the adult. He was the one in charge. The old brand would have lost it and cursed at the sky and probably broken a bunch of things too. But he wasn't going back to being that guy. He knew where that led, and he couldn't go back there. In this situation, it was probably worse. It probably led to a death by stabbing for both himself and his young daughter. It's okay, Macy, Bran said. We're gonna win. We just thought the game was over, and it's not. This time, I'm not gonna stop until there's nothing left. I'm gonna tear Creature to shreds and then burn what's left of it. Oh yeah, burn it, good idea, Macy said. He wasn't sure how he would go about that, though. He hadn't smoked in years now and didn't own a single match, much less a lighter. This was Christmas. Where was the little matchstick girl when he needed her? Then he remembered how that story ended and tried to find someone else to be his mascot. Maybe the human torch would be better. Flame on, Bran said. Then he smiled. He had a gas stove. That was something he owned that produced flame. He could definitely turn Creature to Ash with that. He had his endgame strategy lined up. Now he just had to figure out how to get the pieces lined up to make it happen. Okay, Macy, grab one of these knives and let's go hunt us a monster, huh? He tried to look as brave as possible for Macy's benefit, but he was not all that confident in his ability to succeed. So far, Creature had won every single time, even when Brand had thought he'd been victorious. It had turned out that he was, in fact, not. So, what would be different this time? Was his experience and determination enough? He suspected that, at the very least, they could flee the house and live to fight another day. But he wasn't upbeat on achieving victory. Unlike the rest of his life, however, rather than run from the hardship, he was going to face it head on. They walked back toward the living room as they had done before, back to back. Macy walked backwards, watching for a surprise rear attack, and Brand went forward as the vanguard. As soon as they came around the counter, they saw a Creature. There he is, Brand said, and Macy came up beside him. Somehow, Creature's head was reattached, and the damage done from its turn in the blender was gone as well. It had apparently used a healing spell or gotten some sort of power-up or a green mushroom. Brand's stomach dropped and his confidence level fell even further. If this was a possibility, then could they destroy it completely and put an end to this at all? Creature held up a steak knife of its own to match the ones Brand and Macy held. Then, fast as a flash, Creature threw the knife end over end at Macy. Look out! Brand shouted and pushed Macy out of the way. The knife was aimed at Macy's face but stabbed into Brand in the ribs, glancing off the bone and clattering away, but not before taking a chunk of flesh and starting up the blood flow. It hurt worse by far than the wound in his ankle, and he grabbed at the gash, grunting and moaning. I'll get him, Macy said, recognizing the fact that Creature was now unarmed and vulnerable. She pushed her way around Brand and charged the elf, diving for it as it skittered away to avoid her hands. As bad as Bran's ribs hurt, he couldn't sit there nursing the cut while he allowed his young daughter to put herself in possibly worse danger than he'd faced. So he tore after the two of them, coming to Macy's side as she scrambled after Creature on her hands and knees. The elf was both nimble and quick. It reminded Bran of trying to kill the many cockroaches he'd encountered in this apartment. They were always able to slip just out of reach of the shoe that he was trying to smash them with. Creature got away from Macy, and Bran tried to bring his foot down on it just like a cockroach, but Creature juked out of the way before he could stomp on it and raced back in the other direction, behind them. Bran spun and dove for it, but Creature slipped under the couch before he could grab it. Brand was too determined to let that stop him, however. He took a hold of the couch by the bottom edge and upended it, revealing Creature's stash of steak knives and other assorted sharp instruments. Creature was clearly startled to be exposed this way and made a beeline for the nearest knife. Brand stomped at it but missed. Creature got a knife and slashed Brand's shoe. Luckily for him, it only cut the shoe fabric and not his flesh. Creature raised the knife high to stab it down and into Brand's foot when out of nowhere, a pink, My Little Pony bedecked shoe crushed down on him and sent the knife flying. Good job, Macy! Oh my god, I love you! Don't lift your foot up! Brent could see Creature's head protruding from under Macy's foot, thrashing about trying to free itself, so he stepped down on it, adding his weight to it. 
Okay, okay. So we've got it. Now what do we do? Brand asked Macy. He hadn't expected to actually succeed. He was so excited he had dropped his knife in the scramble to catch Creature. But luckily, Creature had provided him with plenty of knives to use here under the couch. He grabbed one. Keep your foot down, Macy. I'm going to start cutting him up. Brand lifted his foot and kneeled down beside Macy. Creature's face was out from under Brand's foot, and it began struggling to get free. Its eyes narrowed with hate at Brand, but he ignored it, took hold of the head from the sides, and sawed its neck in two. Without the head, the body went limp again, but this time Brand wasn't going to be caught off guard. Okay, lift your foot slowly, Macy, he instructed. As soon as he could get his fingers under the shoe, he grabbed Creature's body. He pulled one arm out and sawed it off. Then he pulled the other arm out and sawed it off. He dropped each arm to the ground next to the head as he removed them, but was surprised to see the first arm start squirming like an earthworm, and the head began rolling back and forth as well. Shit, we don't have enough time. We've got to get the pieces burning, too. He scooped up the dismembered sections from the floor and dashed toward the kitchen. Come on, Macy. In the kitchen, he flipped the knob on the stove, igniting the burner after the usual popping noise. The blue flame burst from the gas jets, and Brand held a wriggling arm to the fire. As soon as it began to burn, all the various elements of Creature's body doubled their thrashing. This wasn't going to work. He was going to drop something. Macy, here, take this arm and hold it to the flame. Brand handed her the other arm, making her actually yank it from his fingers to ensure she had a good hold on it. Be careful not to burn your fingers, though, okay? Okay, Brand, I got it. And she went straight to work. Soon, the arm was completely ablaze, and it quit flailing about. Brand dropped it onto the burner and brought the head over. It had no way to create locomotion, so Brand figured it was fine to just stick it on the burner next to the nearly consumed arm. All he had left was the body, with the legs still attached. He held the legs in his fist and put the head end of it to the flame. When the fire caught in its stuffing, he couldn't help but smile big. Macy dropped the arm she had been holding onto the fire, as there was no longer any non-flaming portion to hold. The head was fast becoming a pool of melted plastic. The arms were gone, and now the body was a felt-covered torch, burning down to nothing. This was going to work. The ordeal was about to be over. He giggled and looked at Macy, who was also feeling giddy, and giggled back at him. Bye-bye, creature, she said. I never liked you, not even a little. The flame on the body was licking its way towards Bran's fingers. He adjusted his grip downwards to avoid getting burned, and right at that moment, what was left of creature made its move. The legs twisted and kicked, springing out of Bran's hand. Oh, God, he said, as the body spun in the air and landed perfectly like an Olympic gymnast on its two feet. Brand! Oh no! Macy shouted. The remaining portion of Creature dashed down the counter and leaped to the floor, flame trailing behind it like a jet engine. Brand dashed after it, wishing he had something, anything, a glass of water, a fire extinguisher, to put out the flame that was running through the living room. Unfortunately, all he could do was watch from a few paces behind as it ran to his dried-out Christmas tree and hopped into the branches. The tree was so dry that it burst into flames as if it had been doused in lighter fluid. One moment, it was just a tree, dropping dried needles onto the vinyl floor. An instant later, it was a 12-foot-tall ball of fire big enough to burn the ceiling. The cheap but cheery glass ornaments on the branches exploded like popcorn kernels on a stove. The foam angel on the pinnacle ignited like a rocket. With a slight amount of satisfaction, Brand saw the last of Creature consumed in the flames. Creature was gone and done, but were things any better? He had a roaring bonfire in his living room and no way to even try to put it out. All he could do was to run. He turned to collect Macy and head to the door when the pyre that was his erstwhile Christmas tree toppled to the ground. It landed on the overturned couch, which quickly caught fire as well. Macy screamed, Brand! Brand, help! The fire was between Brand and Macy. 
and extended from one side of the room to the other. There was no way he could get to her and rescue her without running through the flames. Could he get around the apartment to the back window and pull her out? He'd never been back there, but he knew he had to go around the whole building to get there. Macy locked tear-filled eyes with Brand. Daddy! Help me! She screamed again. Daddy. She had never called him that before. Despite the fire, his skin prickled with goosebumps. His body filled with adrenaline. He didn't care if he was horribly burned in the process. He was going to get that girl to safety. I'm coming, Macy, he yelled, coughing with the smoke. He grabbed the blankets that had made up Macy's bed off the floor and wrapped them around himself, backed up until he was against the wall and dashed forward, leaping over the flames. He checked himself to ensure he was unscathed when Macy ran to him and locked him in a hug. He hugged her back quickly, but then pushed her away. They didn't have much time. Okay, let's get out of here, he said. He peeled off one of the blankets and wrapped it around her. She was eight years old, a little too big to pick up and carry around easily, but he hoisted her blanket-wrapped body into his arms. She wrapped her arms around his neck. Hold on, Macy, he said, and backed up the one step he could until he was against the wall. He ran forward and leaped over the flames again, landing on the other side. He realized that he hadn't done as well this time. Both of the blankets were on fire. Drop the blanket, he shouted, extricating himself from his. Macy yanked hers to the floor as well and turned to run for the door. Bran followed right behind her. They pulled the door open and at last were able to breathe fresh air again. They'd made it out alive. They couldn't just fall on the sidewalk and rest once they were out, unfortunately. The building was on fire, and Brand had many neighbors that needed warning. He first ran to his upstairs neighbor, an elderly woman named Flo who would probably need help getting out. Once she was out, he went to the surrounding units while Flo called 911. The fire department arrived quickly, and the fire was put out. No one lost their life because of creatures' malevolence although there was significant property damage, and dozens of people were forced out of their homes on Christmas Eve. Most of what Brand owned was destroyed in the blaze. He didn't have much to begin with, but now he was completely destitute. Macy's Christmas presents that were supposed to be brought by Santa were also destroyed. Would this be the last year that she believed? She would certainly believe in other things after what they'd seen. Brand still had no idea what had happened. What was Creature? Was it a possessed doll or something else? He didn't know. He'd never believed in supernatural things before. If he hadn't been with Macy the whole time, he would have guessed that he'd fallen off the wagon and had a bad trip instead. Now he knew there were actual forces of evil out there in the world. He hoped he would never meet one of them again. The Christmas tree fire seemed to remove any suspicion that they might have encountered about their knife wounds. Paramedics stitched up Macy's hand and bandaged Bran's wounds in his ankle and ribs. They also put some kind of cream on a couple of second-degree burns on his back where the fiery blanket had shielded him from the worst of the flames. Macy had escaped burn-free, however. When they asked them what happened, they just said they didn't know. The wounds had come from their scramble to get out of the apartment. Brand and Macy had planned that strategy while they were waiting for the firefighters to arrive. Macy had insisted that no one would believe what had really happened, and Brand had agreed. He was also worried that they would suspect him of stabbing Macy's hand. The Christmas tree fire wiped all those worries away, thankfully. The two of them spent the next two nights in a motel room that was paid for by the Red Cross. Brand could not have afforded it himself, and now he was going to be even more cash-strapped, considering all his clothes and other belongings had just burned to cinders. They said they would help him get back on his feet, and he was really thankful for that, because before he'd turned his life around, he'd worn out his welcome with any friends and family that one would usually lean on in a time like this. Rose finally returned from her cruise on the 26th. She'd had a pretty rotten vacation, because... Once she'd heard the news of the fire, she'd been unable to stop worrying. She would have come back immediately if there had been any way to do so. She ran to Macy and hugged her tightly the moment she laid eyes on her in the parking lot of the hotel. Oh my god, baby! 
Are you okay? Rose said, squeezing Macy so tight that she complained of being unable to breathe. I'm fine, Mommy. Don't squish me to death, Macy said. Ethan, standing back a few paces, laughed. <laughs> yeah, that would be silly, right? You survive a fire only to be squished to death by Mommy when she hugs you. Macy and Rose gave this little joke a chuckle, but Bran noticed that Macy didn't seem to appreciate his interjection into the scene. Bran couldn't decide whether he should enjoy that or not. There was no way he was ever getting together with Rose again, if you could call what they had getting together at all in the first place. Nonetheless, he harbored some small resentment toward Ethan for being the other dad that he was competing against for Macy's affections. She lived all the way over in Fort Worth, though, and he would only be seeing her on rare occasions, so it was probably better if she got on well with the guy that would be caring for her on a more regular basis. Still, we couldn't suppress a slight grin. When Rose was finished fawning over Macy, she sent her inside to grab what little stuff she had to bring home. Just the clothes she'd had on when they ran out of the burning apartment. What she was wearing now was donated by the Red Cross and barely fit. Unexpectedly, Rose gave Brand a big bear hug, too. I'm sorry about your house, Brand. I hope you get back on your feet, okay? But thank you so much for making sure Macy was safe. Was it hard to get out of the fire, or were you guys okay all along? She asked. It wasn't a big deal. We got out just fine, Brand said. Rose smiled and hugged him tight again. Well, that's good. I'm glad everything was okay. Macy came out with her new backpack. This one was also a My Little Pony bag, but looked as though it had probably seen better days. Okay, pumpkin, Rose said. Let's go. The three of them jumped into the car, waved goodbye to Brand, and drove out of sight. Brand was alone again, as he had been for years, but this time it didn't feel quite as bad. He had hope for the future now, like he'd never had before. Even with all his belongings destroyed, or most of them, he would know what survived tomorrow when he was allowed to go back in and sift through the rubble. At least he knew that Creature had not survived. He could rest assured of that. He went back into his motel room, sat on the bed, and turned the TV on. The options were pretty limited on the cable they provided, but he could sign into his Netflix account with the smart TV's features, which vastly improved his options. He found an old karate movie from the 70s and sat back and relaxed. About a half hour later, there was a knock at his door. Weird. Who would be looking for him? Especially here. He looked out the peephole and saw Rose on his stoop. He opened the door and now could see that Rose was there with Macy as well. Hi, guys, he said. What are you doing here? I thought you left. Macy wouldn't let us leave until... Rose trailed off and nodded down at Macy. I wanted to give you a present, Macy said. You didn't have any presents under your tree, but you deserve a present. So I told Mommy that we had to stop and get you one. I hope you like it. She thrusted a box into his hands and he smiled and took it from her. Wow. Thank you, Macy. That's so nice. Usually, that phrase is just a platitude with no actual meaning behind it. But in this case, Brand couldn't have meant it more. He blinked back tears as he slipped off the ribbon holding the two halves of the box together. There were two clear plastic packages with clothing inside. It's underwear and socks, Macy said. I didn't know what to get you, but Mommy said you would need it. Thank you, Macy. She was right. I need anything I can get. Turns out my house burned down the other day. <laughs> yeah, I know, Macy said, laughing. And she stepped forward, giving Brand a big hug around his midsection. Rose joined in, and they had a heavenly little group hug. Brand felt like the luckiest guy in the world. Okay, Rose said. We've got to go for real this time. It's going to take a while to get back to Fort Worth, and now it's getting dark. Have a good drive, Brand said. We will, Rose said, backing away from his door with her arm around Macy's shoulders. And listen, give me a call. Macy says she wants to see you again soon, so don't be a stranger and all that, okay? Brand smiled. Okay, he said. I will. They got in their car and drove away again. He watched them go, and then closed the door behind him and settled back down in front of his karate movie. 
Tomorrow, the Red Cross was taking him to a thrift store to pick out a new wardrobe. That should do nicely. All of his clothes that burned in the fire had come from thrift stores as well, so he would be right back where he started from in that regard. He was already partway there, however, with a packet of socks and a packet of boxers that he'd gotten as a Christmas present from his daughter. His daughter that he would be seeing again soon. And now, a word about today's story. Hello, this is Graeme W. Cox, Vice President of the CCAB Corporation, makers of fine, high-quality holiday keepsakes. This story was, alas, not fictional. And even more, alas, not all that uncommon. Sure, Brand and Macy made it through their Christmas alive, but many others have not been so lucky. If you see off-brand, unofficial elf-on-the-shelf knockoffs, do not buy them. Many are, indeed, evil. Some crave the taste of human flesh. Several of them love to rape. One that I'm aware of delights in changing browser settings and altering computer passwords. Even if you are lucky enough to get a non-homicidal one, none are high-quality holiday keepsakes. That is why I am suggesting, nay, urging, you fine people to buy only officially licensed CCAB LLC products, rather than anything illegitimate. It's what right-thinking people do, what good Americans do. Be a good American, like me. Have a happy and safe holiday season. Thanks. All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed part two of The Christmas Creature by B.D. Anklevich. That's me. It is you. Now, this is... It is. This is from this year yeah sort of i mean i started it last december but i didn't finish it you know we 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 talked last time around about coming up with our prompt that was to get us to write a story during december a christmas story that's what this was from last year you know this was my story for last december writing the christmas story and i got it started you know, during December last year, and I got part way through it, but yeah, I never finished it. And uh, you convinced me, I guess it was April, I think, because you started writing, did you start in what, in, in February or March? When did you start doing this I'm gonna write every day kick that you got on for a little while? It must have been in February, because that's when the writer's conference is that I go to every ah, year. And right. the years tend to meld together. I didn't know if this was this year <laughs> or last year. One of the years, was it last year, was the one where I just couldn't write. I didn't want to write anymore. And I just, I, that's odd because usually when I don't write, I feel guilty about it. I feel like I'm not fulfilling my, fulfilling my destiny. But that year, whether it was 2018 or 2019, I just didn't care. I was just like, what have I become? my sweetest friend. It took you saying, okay, here's a prompt. I'm going to give you a prompt so that you will write again. And yeah, that ended up being a, a novel that I wrote <laughs> from your damn prompt. I, but, but I don't think I ever looked back after that. It just, I kept writing. Huh. Not every single day, but it's like once I finished with that, it's just like, well, why stop now? Was that last year? Was that 2018? That was 2018, because the prompt you're talking about is the uh, Metallica song, right? It is. Yeah, or sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I lost track of the years for a second there. It's 2019 now, so that was 2018, when because I wrote my story uh, based on a Metallica title as well in 2018, and then, yeah, I didn't, didn't do anything uh, for, for a while. But yeah, you were, you were going... Okay, so yeah, 2019, I had already decided to write every single day when the writers' conference happened. So it was uh, it was nice to. Well, I still felt guilty 
because that's part <laughs> of the purpose of those things is here are people that are successful and uh, they're going to talk about... You should be too. Yeah. Why aren't you? That's, that's <laughs> the name of every panel, which is just, you know, they <laughs> phrase it differently just, you know, to switch things up. But uh, yeah, so I, I think February I wrote every single day. And uh, although that's a, a long ways away from April... Yeah, you did it in February, and then you did it again in March, and you kept bugging me. You were just like, you should be writing, you should be writing, you should... Oh, by the way, hey, uh, I just called to tell you that you should be writing. And I was just like, gosh, F off. I don't want to write. I don't even like writing. When have I ever said that I want to write? And uh, you wouldn't <laughs> let me off the hook, and you kept bugging me. And So finally, come April... I gave in and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to write every day this month. And I, <laughs> if I remember right, I decided that I would start writing that month right at the same time as you were like, you know what? This writing every day thing is just too much. Uh, I got to okay. stop it. So I passed the torch and to you. <laughs> you're like, I can't get anything else done. My, my you know, my podcasts are falling behind. I've, I've got this audio book I'm supposed to be getting done and I'm not getting it done. And you were just like... <laughs> This writing every day thing is stupid. Whose <laughs> idea was this? Stephen King? That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So basically, I started writing right when you kind of decided to give it up, which I think helped me to also give it up when I finished my story. Because, yeah, I got into it. I think I wrote another smaller story before I jumped into this one to finish this one up, I, I wrote something little and then I was like, okay, now I can do this. And so I started writing it and <sighs> as has been happening to me a lot recently, it ballooned. It wasn't supposed to be 14,000 words. You know, it's just a story about a evil elf on the shelf. It's <laughs> how does this become one of my longer stories? But it did. Uh, and yeah, it turned out to be a, a, a quite uh you know a, a process to get it all written and then once i had it written i was just like okay so what should i do now and i think what i wound up doing was convincing myself that pre-planning for a story also counts as writing and each day i worked a little bit on planning out the outline for the Gauntlet, which is a novel that I have been meaning to write. And I got it mostly put together before I finally petered out. And now I'm back in that mindset again of I need to get back to writing every day. So I'm trying that again. But yeah, it was your, uh, <laughs> your impetus that got me to finish this story up and actually get all the way through it. So that was nice, because to tell you the truth, I really like this story. I like the way it turned out, and I'm glad that I managed to finish it. I, it was funny, I think, because I remember finishing it in April and telling you, yeah, I finished my Christmas story. And you're like, all right, just in time. And I said, yeah, well, uh, but at the very least, we have our Christmas stories. Both you and I have our Christmas stories done. And we can have them totally ready to go so that we don't have to publish them on the night before Christmas like we do every year. And then, yeah, <laughs> I didn't look at my story again until it was well into November. And I went, oh, crap. It's going to wind up getting published the night before Christmas because I didn't plan ahead like I should have. Or I didn't keep with my plans that I planned ahead. My plan was to read it like all the way back in, you know, April when I finished it and then, you know, edit it and just have it totally ready to go so that we could just do it at any time. But instead I didn't. And as usual, we're getting it out basically so that no one can listen to it during the Christmas season. They have to listen to it once the Christmas season is over. Well, that's not as much your fault as it usually is. Yeah, we did have some extenuating circumstances. Which isn't a backhanded compliment if I've ever given you one. You're not as fat and ugly as you usually are. We, we did lose a week. Yeah. But you have really, uh, I don't know, a modern version of girding your loins. You have 
really pulled things together uh, to make sure that this came out before Christmas when I just figured, oh, well, you know, that's okay. Mostly I was just like, well, I'm off the hook for my story for this year. <laughs> and that's fine. So weird that we've had three episodes in a row of your stories. Yeah, that is an unusual event. But yeah, you've really pulled things together so that this could happen. And that's cool. And hopefully the audience uh, is, is happy that they didn't have to wait until January. Or when did we threaten? February for the, uh, <laughs> the second half of the story. Right. That uh, doesn't mean they're not on the hook for donations, but uh, here we are. Here it goes. Now, you said you uh, were happy with the way it turned out. Do you mean the ending or just the overall story? Just the whole thing. The the ending I liked and the, the overall story as well. Did you know where you were going with it, where it was going to end when you started writing this? I didn't completely. I kind of had an inkling. I think the fire was kind of there as the ending for me all along. I didn't know how it was going to be achieved. But I have worked in news for a long time. So year after year after year, we get video from some fire department or another that uh, is made to help the public understand just how dangerous Christmas trees can be. Um, I remember uh, I, I used to work with a guy in Sacramento who uh, made this show. He, he was a host of horror movies. It was like Elvira or something like that, you know. He he was that guy that would just, like, come back in between commercials and he would, you know, tell you about some stuff about the movie you're about to watch more of and then it would go into the movie and you'd watch more of it and then he would come back and do a little funny thing and then it would go to a commercial and then he'd come back and he'd do a little funny thing go back into the movie. And one time he really, really wanted to take that video <laughs> that we got from the fire department and say, uh, Merry Christmas from Cinema Insomnia, as, yeah, you see the uh, Christmas tree just going foof up like a torch. Because, yeah, we get that every year. You got video from some fire department where they just show you just how fast those dried up old Christmas trees that have been sitting in your living room for, you know, since Thanksgiving will go up in flames. That, that's always fun stuff. So it's, it was easy to, I guess, what I'm saying is easy to settle on the method of the fire in the end. Although creature jumping into the tree while on fire, while <laughs> being nothing but legs at that point, that was, uh, you know, stuff that developed as it came. But I had a lot of fun with creature... And just how indestructible he was, you know what I mean? Like, uh, they kept killing it and kept killing it, and he uh, never, you know, he always bounced back. And I, I don't know why, but I really enjoyed doing that. <laughs> it's interesting, because I just listened to your story that you put on the Rich Outcast called Todd, Jenny, and the Ugly Doll. Yeah, there are similarities, aren't there? I was curious because you talked about this afterwards and you, you mentioned the idea of, you know, having a doll as a bad guy in a story or a movie especially as being really difficult to pull off uh, to make it scary. And you even said, yeah, you know, I, I made the decision early on to just go for making this funny because... That's easier, the easier way to do it. And, you know, Chucky is always like, yeah, he's supposed to be kind of scary, but he's mostly like a slapstick character that's saying uh, cheesy one-liners and stuff like that. And uh, I'm pretty sure that I just didn't do that with this one. I mean, there's possibly a few funny lines here and there, but for the most part, I, I think I played it straight. And I'm curious, <laughs> did it work? Did he... Did, creature feel like a scary thing like something that was legitimately dangerous or was it i don't know what what there was a movie that i'm trying to think of 
where there's a bunch of tiny little creatures. Like subspecies or something? It wasn't, it was, they were like demons or something, like little tiny elves or goblins or something like that. And they, they come and they try and kill this kid by holding his, plugging his nose when he's asleep. Oh, I like that. And then he just opens his mouth because, you know, he got two <laughs> holes to breathe through. I can't remember what the movie was called. It's one of those. I, I, I assume that you would immediately realize what I'm talking about and jump on it because you're very knowledgeable when it comes to horror movies. But it wasn't the little troll in Cat's Eye that was trying to kill Drew Barrymore by doing that, was it? Maybe. I can only vaguely remember it. Um, yeah, my friend had recorded it off of... Uh, off of like the TV or something like that. And I just remember seeing that scene and him just laughing. I was like, this is so dumb. Like this is a stupid, tiny little thing. And yeah, that that's one of those things that you always worry about. And I suppose they talk about that a little bit in this story where they're just like, he's small. It's not a big deal. We, could, we, sh we can just deal with him this way. Well, I think that the fact that it harms the daughter you know what I mean? That it stabs her? Uh-huh. That establishes that it is a threat, a real threat, and that, you know, it's not just misunderstood, and it's not just, you know, ugly but harmless. It, it wants to hurt the child. I mean, that ups the threat level there. I know there are a lot of complaints in movies about children being put in jeopardy. For some reason, that really upsets a certain portion of the audience. Huh. Uh, not not me at all. It's just, you know, it was like the outrage when Zara was killed in Jurassic World where they said, never before has a woman been killed by a dinosaur in a Jurassic Park movie. Oh, OK. Well, I think you're you're showing your cards a little bit there when that's the pro problem that you had with her death. <laughs> I don't know. Children tend to be helpless or vulnerable or weaker and their fear is more palpable. And so when you put a child in, in jeopardy, it's shorthand. You're able to communicate to the audience, you know, that this is bad. It doesn't just go after the parents because it has some kind of sense of honor. Right. And so, I, I, yeah, I think Creature, because it hurt a kid, is, yeah, it's a legit threat. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's weird how that there has to be this fine line of like, what a bad guy can do, or how far a bad guy can go, or whatever. And I know that there, there are all of these holier-than-thou writing experts that have their little TV tropes names for everything. And it just has to stop, guys. It doesn't make you sound smarter. It just makes you sound like we're in a little club, and you're not welcome. But they have this term, kick the dog, which is some thing that screenwriters add in to show just how bad this guy is. And a lot of times it's like, we'll give this guy the one F word we're allowed in our PG-13. <laughs> and it's like, ooh, this guy is bad. Right. He said a word. They, they have him kick the dog or they have one of their uh, lackeys doesn't please them. And so they kill the lackey to show how bad this guy is. Okay, I, if that if that gets you there, son, if him saying the F word means that he's truly bad, all right, they've done their job. But to me, it's just like, yeah, that it tried to kill his, his little daughter shows, okay, you know, this thing can't be reasoned with. This thing, it, this thing has to go. And, you know, with something like that, with Creature... I didn't know whether it was going to be evil or not at the beginning. I just thought, well, mm -hmm. okay, it's alive and that's a problem, but maybe it's not. Maybe it just wants to contribute to Christmas in a way, or maybe it just doesn't like the dad mm -hmm. because the dad, you know, doesn't like it right. kind of thing. But, but yeah, once its intentions are known, that yeah, then it's an effective villain. And I did like that it just kept popping up and, and the part where, you know, you said, it picked up its head. <laughs> and the way you say it, <laughs> it, it surprised even the author. Yeah, I just, truthfully it did. I, you know, I, I think, you know, I was saying I had a lot of fun with that where, you know, yeah, they killed it and no, they didn't. It's still not dead. 
and then they would kill it, you know, they threw it in the blender and oh no, it's still not dead. And, and even the, the damage was repairing itself on its own, you know, some magic or whatever is creature is back to full strength, you know, all the little divots from riding the blender have uh, been massaged away while he was hiding under the couch or whatever, and he's back, and I'll, it felt like a lot of fun to, to keep doing that, to where they're just like, you know, what in the crap can we do to kill this thing? You know, they kept killing it, and it was never enough. <laughs> I suppose in the end they 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 didn't win <laughs> because they never quite killed it enough. It wound up just burning the last bit of itself and you know almost killing them still. But yeah, I I, I just had a lot of fun uh, with that aspect of it for sure. I I think I would be remiss if I didn't act as audience proxy and ask: Were you ever tempted to have? creature win and kill the child <laughs> yeah that's funny I, I i didn't think about that until just recently but what was the last story of mine that we did uh, little, little caesar's, caesar's ghost right and i think it was tina kolakowski who commented on the post about that story saying uh whoa big anklevich with a, a a story with a happy ending i don't know how i'm supposed to deal with this and yeah i i wonder <laughs> <laughs> now that we've gone two stories in a row, and they both, you know, turn out with happy endings, they'll do. But yeah, no, I didn't really. I wasn't tempted to to do that. And to tell you the truth, and I think I've probably mentioned this a little bit in the past, but a lot of my morbid fascination with, you know, dark endings, depressing endings, whatever you want to call them, unhappy endings seems to have evaporated a little bit. I don't know if I've just gotten old enough to where I, I don't, you know, think that's as cool as I used to when I was younger or something. I can't say that it won't happen more because there's a lot of ideas that I came up with still back in those days that I haven't written yet. <laughs> so uh, because I'm, you know, so terrible at getting my writing done. There's a lot of stories that I'll probably get around to uh, that will include some uh, pretty dark or sad endings, or at least dark or sad parts to the story. I have become a little, even with some of those stories that I came up with, you know, the really dour endings, to uh, try to find ways to mitigate them a little bit. You know, it's like, oh yeah, this ends this way, and then, oh, and everybody was away sad. And then I've thought, well, shoot, maybe I better add something in there so that there's at least a glimmer of hope at the end of that story instead. And, and I've come up with various things. And, you know, I turned one story into three because the ending was going to be so bad that I'm like, okay, well, I can't have it end that way. I got to have a, a third part that comes at the end where they undo the sad ending. So, yeah, I've, I've become much less of a, uh, of a of the dark Big Anklevich that you all are so used to uh, as time has gone by. And yeah, with this story, I never really thought that I would make it a bad ending. I did, you know, I mean, obviously the guy's house still burns down, so there is badness to the ending, but... Um, not even Flo got burned up in the fire, so nobody was permanently injured. Well, I guess uh, you're officially old. <laughs> yep. Yep, I've softened up. Aren't you supposed to get, like, all cranky and, and grumpy when you get old, though, and, like, being like, get off my lawn, kids! Oh, good point. Don't make me kill the main character on you! So there's still something to look forward to. <laughs> Do you want me to kill the bunny? Yeah, there's still time. Still time for me to get really, really uh, dark and dreary again. Well, we probably ought to uh, wrap things up right here just so that uh, we can get this episode out before Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Besides, we've got to hurry up and record the episode for yours so that it can get out before Christmas as well. Oh, no. 
Oh, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. Um, before we go, why don't you remind people about the Christmas broken mirror story that we've got for, uh, is it for 2020? So, last week, in the first part of the episode, we went through a bunch of different suggestions from our various listeners for prompts for a Christmas story a broken mirror contest. Rish and I try and write Christmas stories every year, uh, and we thought it would be cool to give you guys the chance to give us a prompt that we could use for our Christmas uh, story. So everybody gave us a bunch of prompts. We went through, we chose them, and uh, the one that we settled on was you're invited to your girlfriend's... Or boyfriend. boyfriend. Right, family Christmas dinner for the first time. But the meal isn't what you were expecting. So uh, Rish and I have already started writing our Christmas stories. We try and get ours done in the month of December. Uh, obviously, as I said earlier, I don't always succeed. But the idea is to get it done in the month of December for us. Now, the idea for y'all is you are open to also write a Christmas story for next December. We will give you until the end of January to write your story because uh, we didn't give you enough time to to write it in the month of December since we didn't even publish the first episode of The Christmas Creature until, you know, a few days ago. So you will get some extra time. You guys can write all the way through the end of January and then submit us a story. If you've got one that you'd like us to try and run on the show next December, we're going to have a full-on extravaganza of Christmas, I guess, because we'll have my story, we'll have Rish's story, and we'll have some stories from listeners. You know, we don't know how many, but we'll take a look at them. The good thing is we'll have the whole year to read them. (laughs) We'll read them through, and we'll pick which ones we like. And uh, we will decide on using a few of them. And we'll have a full-on Christmas extravaganza. It'll be the biggest Christmas feast since King Wenceslas looked out upon the Feast of Stephen. I already used that line in my Facebook post, but that's okay. (laughs) They don't know that. Well, now they do. Oh, shoot. I gave it away. They probably totally forgot it. It was such a not memorable line. (laughs) Anyway, so yeah, if you're interested in uh, doing a story based on that premise, the premise again was... You are invited to your girlfriend's... Or boyfriend's... Family family Christmas dinner for the first time. But things don't exactly go as expected. How close to it was I? You were very close. You got it word for word until you got to the meal part. It says the meal isn't what you were expecting, but you said things weren't. Well, that's too bad because we got to change it to things because uh, I've already written my story. (laughs) All right. So yeah, if you're interested, go ahead, start a scribbling and let's see what you can come up with. And uh, yeah, we will see you again next time. And next time will be rather soon because we're running out of time. I think Santa and his reindeers have already left the North Pole, so we better get to work if we're going to get your story out before Christmas as well. Thanks for listening, everybody. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And in this holiday season, hold your girlfriend... Or boyfriend. ...close. Because I don't have one. Good night. (laughs) (laughs) See you, folks. At the Dune Steve, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, so you can give it to anyone but you cannot change it or make money off it. Chalupa for you, Rish. Take two.
patter, pitter patter, pit to patter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter, pit to patter patter, dash away, dash away, dash away all. There was a pong sound in the knife that it had been carried. Pong. There was a pong sound in the knife that had. Pong. There was a pong sound. What? There was a pong sound in the knife. Shit. (laughs) There was a pong sound and the knife that it had been carrying fell harmlessly from its hands. Especially considering that Brand had no idea what made the thing tick in the first place. I gotta go put on some shoes. My feet are freezing. But the pressure of the pulling and the serrated steak knife sawing almost immediately severed the head from the neck. And Creature went limp again. He dropped... He dropped the decapitated body back to the counter. He dropped the decap... He dropped the decapitated... He dropped the decapitated body back to the counter. Brand couldn't help but smile and hug her back. That shouldn't have a comma. In this situation, it was probably worse. It probably led... It probably led... Damn, why can't you say probably today? Probably... It probably led to... It probably led to... Da, it probably led to a death by stabbing. It hurt worse by far than the wound in his ankle. And he grabbed at the wound. It's another word for wound. I can't use wound twice in the same sentence. Come on, woundy. Gash. It hurts... It hurt worse by far than the wound in his ankle, and he grabbed at the gash, grunting and moaning. Macy locked tear field... Macy locked... Why do I say field all the time with tear... Tear field? I think I did that in the last story. Brand had many neighbors that needed warning. He first ran to his upstairs neighbor. First. (laughs) Derp de derp derp. He had hope for the future now, like he'd never had before. Screw you guys. I'm going home. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.